morning. It's so wonderful to be together. And let's just lift up our voices and join with the multitudes in heaven, doing worshiping, bowing before the throne 24-7. And what a great privilege it is for us to be able to join with them this morning.
Heavenly Father, we stand before your presence this morning with awe and reverence, Lord, in adoration to who you are. Father, the ground on which we stand this morning is a holy ground because your presence is here with us this morning. And Lord, because of your presence and your spirit who is going to minister to us, reach out to us and touch us, Father, I pray that our hearts will be ready this morning, Lord. We just want to exalt your name in this place because of what you have done for us. Father, we thank you. May our hearts and our voices be lifted up in worship this morning with a sincere heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. We worship you, we lift you up, oh Jesus in this place, your name is wonderful, your name is awesome, your name is powerful, oh, your presence Lord is here. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. your breath in our lives so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lives so we pour out our praise to you only Jesus we worship you you give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great to worship you, Jesus. Oh. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great
I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And one generation will commend your works to another. They'll tell of your mighty acts. Oh Lord, as we've sung this morning, we join with the whole of creation, all your works in earth and sky and sea that declare your greatness and proclaim your name. Lord Jesus, the name of Jesus, the one who alone is worthy of our praise. Lord, we bow down before you this morning, declare our worship of you, Lord. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for the cross this morning, the symbol of our life and our salvation and of our freedom. Oh, Lord, be with us, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Move amongst us, touch our hearts, draw us nearer to you, nearer to the Father, we pray, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Great to have you with us this morning here at, albeit in a uh, sort of a strangely socially distanced fashion. Hey, um, wouldn't it be great when all of this is over and we can just all be like fully together? But we're thankful, we're thankful that we can be uh, somewhat together and uh, just so glad that you're here with us uh, this morning. Uh, if you're new, we don't really want you to stick around for very long after the service. It was a strange thing to say. Uh, we're not really unfriendly, but we'd have another service. And so we need to sort of uh, evacuate and then uh, allow time for the next service to come in. But hang around a little bit, just a little bit, and certainly long enough to go to the info point. And uh, you can fill out a care card there, an, a, 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 like a visitor's card. You can give us requests for prayer, other things. And uh, yeah, by all means, please do hang around a little bit, but then be aware that there is um, uh, another service coming in. Uh, just a reminder that MPK, our children's ministry, and Keystone, our high school age ministry, which runs on a Sunday morning, um, just for this period of time, is uh, is running from the very beginning of the, like the service starting time, rather than as we've done in the past, where we sort of send them out partway through. That's just to enable more people to be able to be in the in the auditorium here. So uh, if you've forgotten about that and you're sitting here with your teenagers or your children. Feel free to head out shortly at the right time and uh, someone will guide you uh, in the right direction for those ministries. For now, let's just take a look at uh, some things coming up. Hey church, welcome to What's On. Here's what's coming up. Are you engaged in a relationship and exploring marriage or know someone who is? Starting on Monday, the 21st of September, we're running the Prepare for Marriage course by Alpha. This course aims to help couples invest in their relationship to build a lasting marriage. There are five fun and informative talks followed by an opportunity for discussion. There is no group work and each couple's conversations are completely private. The cost is $60 per couple and includes light refreshments each week. Register online before the 13th of September. Ladies, young and not so young, we are so excited to let you know that our Essence events will start again soon, but we'll begin with a bit of a new look, more regular and more casual. You are invited to join us on the first Thursday of each month during school term from 7.30 till 9.15 p.m. We hope this is a better time for those who work and for mums. We'll enjoy a great speaker on a variety of relevant topics, a delicious supper, fun and encouragement. Our first gathering is Thursday the 3rd of September. 
Psychologist Rochelle Masters from Masters & Co Psychology will speak to us on the topic, stressed out. COVID-19 has brought an added dimension of stress for many. Uncertain futures for those who are studying, financial and job instability, mums juggling demands of work with young children, added to the usual stresses of our fast-paced lives. Rochelle will talk about some ways to help us live well during such times. The cost is $10 and you can register online at mounties.org.au forward slash essence night. Hope you can make it. Church, we know that camps play an important role in a person coming to faith, commitment and engagement with church. McCrindle Research reported that camps was the third most significant activity in helping young people come to faith, ahead of Sunday school and small groups. We were so disappointed when we couldn't run our annual winter camp due to COVID-19. However, summer is coming and Lord willing, we are planning to have a summer camp from the 19th to the 22nd of December, 2020. Mark your calendar, more information will be released in the coming weeks. Stay tuned. That's what's on at church. If you'd like any more information, be sure to check our website at mounties.org.au for all the details. We'll see you next week. Excellent. Our thanks to Marcus and uh, Mia and the team. Um, something else just to let you know about, in a couple of weeks' time, not next Sunday, the Sunday after, we, there, we are having an orange morning. Not a morning tea. There's no way many food involved. COVID. Uh, but uh, an orange morning for parents of skip children, that's uh, pre-primary and kindy age kids, encouraged on that morning to come out and actually spend the morning uh, with your children for a learning experience together. So uh, note that in your diary. Also, just be mindful that um, after our 8.30 service on a Sunday morning, in preparation for the 10.30, between the services, there's a, a little bit of a cleaning regime that goes on, sanitising and wiping down some surfaces. And you just appreciate that's a that's a big job for one person, but a small job for a number of people. So if uh, sitting here this morning you are thinking to yourself, you know what, I could help with that. That's easy. I could do that. Uh, then we just encourage you to put your name down at the info point on a roster. And uh, you know the old saying, many hands make light work. Uh, so you can help with that. That'll be very much appreciated as well. All right, let's bow in prayer, shall we, as we uh, come to give together. Father, in the midst of the chaos of coronavirus, we're reminded, Lord, that you are sovereign. You are Lord. You are good. So today, afresh, we put our trust in you. We thank you for the encouragement that we, we don't need to fear because you promised to be with us wherever we go. And so, Lord, we cling to that promise today. We cling to all the promises of your scripture. We pray in particular for those traveling through challenging times at the moment, for those in the midst of grief, for those facing health challenges, those dealing with unemployment. Lord, for families dealing with crisis and conflict and pain. Lord, help us in all that we face to turn to you and to draw on your life and your strength and your help. Remind us, Lord, even today that our help is in the name of the Lord. And Father, we pray for Simon as he brings us the word this morning. We ask that you would speak through him and uh, open our hearts, Lord, to your word. Guide us, we pray as we give together to enable the work of your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, as you appreciate, we're not passing the buckets these days. We're just encouraging you to come make your way to the front here and give at the front. This morning, we're um, just going to focus on the, uh, the ministry of street chaplains for a few moments. And uh, if you... Uh, Follow the news. The, if you, if, I mean, it's depressing, isn't it, watching the six o'clock news these days? But uh, you know, there's increasing violence in the Northbridge area. Uh, Northbridge is just one of a number of areas across our state where street chaplains are actively involved. And uh, great for us to be aware of what they do and uh, to be prayerful for them. We will pray for them this morning. 
But uh, to find out more, because there's a, quite a number of people across our church family who are actively involved in street chaplaincy, uh, let's meet some of them and hear from them this morning. This uh, ministry of street chaplains is really good for everyday Christians. It's, it's something that every Christian can do. And secondly, it's a blessing for the chaplains themselves because they learn so much about being Christians in a secular society. I'm handing over now to Stephen Carly who will tell you a bit more about what actually happens. Thanks, Gar. Thanks, Mounties, for, for this opportunity. Um, in Perth, Northbridge, we have around 90 chaplains. Um, we get our Friday, Saturday nights, uh, backpacks on our backs, blankets, water, first aid kits, and a whole bunch of stuff there that might be handy. Um, one of the things that we do is we interact with the homeless, um, and we just simply communicate with them, interact, show some care, love, and support uh, in an unselfish and unjudging way. We're also there for the young people who are having a great time. We are look, looking for them on the Northbridge side and on the good side. We're there to help them if they get lost or they can't find their friends. Um, we help them to call their parents or an Uber to get home. We're also there with some first aid if that's needed for them as well. We usually do a roster once a month um, and, and our roster system works really well. Leah and I found, did our first observation back in February prior to our training and I found it quite daunting. Until I hit the streets and felt quite an ample place to be and um, saw the value we were providing there. It's just great to be out there being, I guess, getting your hands dirty for the Lord. I'm so appreciative for the training and the prayer support that comes with it. I wanted to become a street chaplain because I wanted to be the hands and feet of Jesus and certainly that is what you are out on the streets. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to um, meet um, really lovely, lovely people who um, you can um, interact with, have lovely conversations, share with, and um, it's just a blessing. I personally uh, love being a mother of three, love the fact that you um, can go out on the street and uh, be that mother of the street and actually help those who are lost, uh, especially when you see someone who might be uh, alone and you know, I sort of think of my own children and want to be that parent or that mother figure when you're out there and actually guiding them and helping them at that time when they're feeling lost, so I love that, thank you. Uh, no, street shoppers is... Um uh, a mission that runs under the auspices of a small uh, not-for-profit organization, Western Urban Associates, which was formed in 1996. Uh, it's fully accredited with ACNC and all the various bodies. It's a non-deductible uh, gift recipient, and um, it was, uh, it, it's, a, it's a body that basically uh, operates uh, in just only this one sphere of mission. Uh, with your support and your help, we will continue to grow in the years and months to come. And so in these times of great uncertainty, we are so thankful for the certainty we have in Jesus. We thank Mount East Church for allowing us to have our information and training coming up at the end of this month. We are so thankful for our chaplains on the streets, but mostly are we thankful that this ministry belongs to the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for street chaplains. We thank you for this amazing church and we thank you that we have the opportunity to serve you as your hands and feet on the streets. So we pray, Lord, that you'll bless each person here in this video and that they may be stirred and inspired to join us. So we pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. What a great ministry. Uh, and as you can see, a ministry for all ages. I think you have to be over 18 to be a part of street chaplaincy. But um, just a wonderful ministry to be a part of. You can uh, find out more about that. There'll be a couple of our street chaplains in the foyer after the uh, service. If you'd like to chat with them about that, just find out some more information. Um, I remember chatting with Garth Icorn, who I think uh, began the street chaplaincy ministry here in WA. And at one stage I said to him, what, is there kind of a, an ideal person to be a street chaplain and he said well surprisingly perhaps uh, middle-aged women especially mothers just make great street chaplains I guess they have the uh, 
that, uh, that balance of uh, loving compassion and uh, slight scariness in their firmness. Uh, I'm not sure what that is, but, um, but whatever your role in life, whatever your age, whatever your gender, um, there's a place for you with street chaplaincy. So um, uh, be prayerful about whether the Lord might call you unexpectedly into a role in that area of ministry. Let's just pray uh, just quickly for that group and then we'll stand and sing again. Lord, we do thank you for the, uh, the courage. We began our service this morning with those words of the Lord to Joshua. Be strong, be courageous, I'm with you. And uh, Lord, we would just pray that uh, over our street chaplains team that they uh, would be strong, that they'd be courageous as they go into situations that perhaps are intimidating and frightening. Lord, may they know that they go with the strength and the protection of your Holy Spirit around them. Lord, uh, use these folk as they step out in faith in uh, areas and at times that uh, perhaps many of us wouldn't want to be involved and yet, Lord, you've called them and equipped them and enabled them and empowered them for this task. So be with them. And, uh, Lord, for others sitting in the room here this morning who are even feeling a stirring in their hearts, Lord, uh, I pray that you would help each one of us to take that step of obedience in the direction that you call us, whatever that might be, that we might serve you in this world where you've placed us. So guide us together, Lord, and lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we would like to share this um, new song to all of you. It's not really, really new, but it's probably new to us. And it really talks about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that really shouts out love, grace, and forgiveness. And I hope that the words of this, of this song will encourage and inspire us and even challenge us this morning. So let's reflect on the words and um, later on we'll invite you to stand and join us.
from death to life and grace to grace. Praise the Lord Jesus. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I'll see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder. My soul will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. How my soul will sing your praise. How wonderful, how glorious my Savior's task, victory. From death to life, grace to grace. Lord, we come this morning in your grace. Lord, we come to you because of your grace. And Father, because of your great love for us, you've given us life, each one of us life, that we might know you, and Lord, that we might indeed bear your image in the earth. And so, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, that your empowering presence would enable us to possess more of the life that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. Please be seated and good morning. Good to be with you and a real privilege to be sharing the Lord's Word with you this morning. Well, we're going to be concluding today our series, which has been running over the last couple of months, entitled The Power of Encouragement. And today, the Lord is encouraging us to encourage one another, or 
the more. So that's the subject today, encourage one another. And God's heart is for us to be a community of encouragers, you know, where genuine encouragement is reciprocal, where there's a flow, where there's a giving, and where there's a receiving of encouragement. It's about, encouragement's about the other. And the scriptures, you know, are full of the phrase, one another. Encourage one another, love one another, care for one another. We read about the one another right through the scriptures, not simply caring about ourselves and our own interests. See, we all need encouragement, as we've heard in the previous sermons. And we're all called in the love of God to encourage one another. It's God's heart. And of course, a lack of encouragement can amount to discouragement. Silence can be discouraging. Silence, in fact, can be deadly, as we know. So to encourage one another is to come alongside someone. And not just to come alongside someone, but to put courage into their lives. You know, to, to strengthen them, to, to give confidence, to give hope. You know, to recognise the immeasurable value in the other person and the great potential that there is in the other person. You know, to spur them on to what is good and right. You know, and to turn them away from what is harmful. So encouragement is also, you know, the turning away from the things that aren't good for us. So to encourage is to add value into someone's life. And that's a great thing to be doing. And in the end, encouragement is really to invest in someone else's life. And as Peter Christophides often reminds us, when he says, to deposit gold into someone else's life. I love that. See, when I reflect on key transitions, life transitions in my own life, I'm so thankful that there's been people, someone there to speak life into me, to encourage me, to give me strength to take that next step into what the Lord has opened up for me, to possess more of life, really, in the end, and we need one another to do that. And there are many people here today, many people in the room, in fact, that have been a great encouragement to me in these uh, more recent years, to which I'm most thankful. We need one another. And we need the encouragement of one another. See, encouragement is to invest in someone else's future. That's a beautiful thing to be doing. How good is that? And to encourage one another is incredibly powerful and motivating. Even the smallest thing, you know, a smile, a hug, a kind word, a note, a card, a visit, a call, a kind deed. You know, all of these things, very simple things, just listening, sympathy, understanding, you know, presence, friendliness, can spark great accomplishments in other people, can change the direction of their lives, in fact, can change perspectives, the way that people are thinking, and enable great personal growth and development to possess more of life. And that's the power of encouragement. Of course, the opposite to encouragement is discouragement. It's a horrible thing when the dis comes in front of encouragement because it can cause people to give up, to lose hope, to feel not valued, to drain the joy out of their lives. See, to discourage is to dishearten, it's to weaken, it's to take away courage and strength. You know, discourages so seeds of negativity into people's lives. They'd be critical and hurtful, and in the end, sap the very life out of people, the very opposite to what encouragement does. And so discouragement raises the casualty rate where people give up in all sorts of ways in life. 
and it's a shocking thing to witness and to see. We must be so careful with our words. Our words have power. You know, we have the power to kill and we have the power to give life. And many of the messages that we hear in our culture, in the schools, in our workplaces, are actually of the killing kind. And they hurt, they cut deep and they hurt. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. You're useless. You're not smart enough. How many of us have heard those sorts of words spoken to us? See, words can kill or they can give life. They're either poison or they're sustenance. May our words be those that are of sustenance. And of course, knowing the life-giving power of receiving encouragement in our lives, which many of us do, should motivate us to be generous in giving encouragement to others. Very free and generous because we know the power of encouragement working in our own lives. You know, the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, we've coined this phrase that the Lord spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, the golden rule. It'll come up on the screen there. But Jesus said, so in everything, do to others what you would like them to do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets. You see, we all like receiving encouragement, so we should love giving encouragement to others to benefit them, to strengthen them. See, all of Paul's letters in the New Testament are encouraging. They're all about encouragement, actually, encouraging individuals and encouraging churches to go on in the Lord and to choose life, not death, you know, to take hold of what the Lord has accomplished for them you know, to, to reach their potential in the Lord, to go on in the Lord, to use their gifts and talents, to step out in faith, to realise this great potential of the life that the Lord has put in each and every one of us and to actually enter into this abundance of life, live the abundant life, the life that God gives us. Now, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is actually one such letter, it's packed with encouragement from the very beginning to the end, encouraging the believers. And Paul says in chapter 5 and in verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. See, when you see the word therefore, what do you do? You ask, why is it therefore? Why is it therefore? What's it there for? And, uh, <laughs> and Paul, because throughout his letter, as I said, he's been encouraging the church from the start to the finish. And so he's urging them to likewise be encouragers, likewise encourage one another. And the believers, of course, in Thessalonica, those that know the setting there, they were experiencing severe opposition. Great hardship in their lives. Every day was difficult for them. Some were losing their lives for their faith and there was this anxiety about what would happen to those who had lost their lives before the Lord returned. Would they miss out? It was a great concern of theirs. So Paul addresses their anxiety with the truth that the essence of the Christian faith is that we live together with Jesus, in union with Jesus, whether we live or whether we die. And, uh, and Jesus, when he comes, he says, will bring with him those that have died before. They won't miss out. We will always be together. So those who remain, says Paul, can be certain that nothing, neither life nor death, can separate us from Jesus who died to bring us to himself both now and forever. Which would have been great encouragement for them. So he then goes on and finishes with saying, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Interesting that just as in fact you are doing. There was encouragement happening in Thessalonica as there is encouragement happening here 
and there is a lot of encouragement happening here at Mount Pleasant. Yet no community, no community has reached perfection in encouraging and loving one another. And that's why the Lord, right through the scriptures, is encouraging, urging us to do so all the more. It's like Paul in chapter 4. He says, Now about your love for one another. We do not need to write to you, for you love each other. Yet we urge you to do so all the more. You see that? There's more that we can do in the space of encouragement and loving one another. You know, Paul's primary concern throughout his letters is other people, other believers, not himself, but others. It's a beautiful thing. And one of the greatest barriers to being an effective encourager of others is a preoccupation with self with ourselves, with our own fears, our own insecurities, our own busyness and the advancement of our own lives, which can prevent us from even thinking of others, let alone encouraging others. And if we're not careful, we can spend more time criticising or putting other people down than encouraging others. How many times have you been in conversations with someone even spent an evening with them and afterwards reflected on the evening and realised that the person didn't ask one question about you, about your family, about your children, about your work, about your life. See, many people are self-absorbed. And they talk about themselves and their own achievements and what they're doing. They might even seek attention. uh, And therefore, you're going to hear all about their problems. But rarely questions about you and your life. Of course, that's not the case for anyone here. But this is what happens uh, in the world. And this is what happens so often in our lives. But such words lack the power to encourage. Why? Because they're not directed at the interests or the concerns of the other person. But in the end, they're self-serving words that are spoken. But on the other hand, we read in Proverbs chapter 10 that the lips of the righteous nourish many. I love that. There's nourishment in encouragement. It's a beautiful thing. How good to be nourishing and strengthening others with encouragement, you know, which provides nutrition and energy for life when we're encouraged and when we encourage others. And a couple of weeks ago, Nick and I were were talking about the character of encouraging conversations. And in passing, mentioned two types of people. And it's good to reflect on these two types of people the here I am a person, and the there you are a person. I think it's helpful for us to identify whether we're predominantly a here I am person, type of person. It's not totally, but a type of person. And a there you are type of person. See, a here I am person comes into a room and says, here I am, come talk to me, come ask about me, come make me feel comfortable. You know, will I know anyone? You know, will I, will I be noticed? Will I be standing on my own? Will I be accepted? Will I fit in? See, it's mainly about me and my fear and my fears, that my fears might be exposed. My insecurities and weaknesses might be exposed. So I'm on guard. I'm protecting myself. On the other hand, a there you are person, they walk into a room, this is a type of person, We don't think there's just two types of people, but the the there you are type of person walks into a room and says, oh, there you are. You look interesting. I'd like to get to know you. Or look, oh, there you are. You look new. I haven't met you before. I'd love to meet you and get to know you. Or there you are. I haven't seen you for a while. 
like to grab you before you go and have a chat. Can you see the difference there? See, Jesus was and is a there you are person. And there's so many examples in the Gospels. Zacchaeus is one. You remember Zacchaeus up in the tree? Jesus said, there you are. And he came down and he gladly welcomed Jesus into his life. It's a beautiful moment for Zacchaeus. See, Jesus knows you and he says to each one of us, there you are. That's what Jesus says, there you are. Come, follow me into life. Jesus wants to give us what he has that we might possess life. And so he says, there you are, and he calls you to himself. And when there you are, people see someone, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking, how can I get to know what's happening in this person's life for the sole purpose of being able to encourage them and to help them and to care for them? See, our degree of friendliness and ability to connect in meaningful ways is linked to whether we are predominantly a here I am person or a there you are person. It's not about being an introvert or an extrovert, but it's about a mindset. It's about a disposition that's about taking your eyes off yourself and shifting the focus to another person in the room. This makes a massive difference to how friendly we are as a church. Huge difference in how readily we connect and develop meaningful relationships. So what prevents us from being a there you are person? Well, predominantly fear. It's fear. We fear. And many of our challenges stem from the fact we fear. So what happens is our fear causes to erect barriers, create distance, that prevents meaningful conversations and prevents the development of meaningful relationships. It's the age-old problem of hiding behind masks, self-protection, which began where? In Genesis 3. That's where it began. See, before Adam and Eve fell away from God and chose to work life out by themselves, you know, they had unhindered conversation with God unhindered relationship with God. No distance, there was no barriers, there was no masks, there was no tension, there was no fear. But immediately, immediately sin. When sin came, it delivered horrific consequences, including the presence of a new emotion called fear. Adam knew he wasn't right, and so he feared that he'd be rejected that he'd be rejected by God. So when God asked him, Adam, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. See, Adam was not talking about physical nudity or simply about that. He knew he wasn't right. Something was wrong. And if he was really known or was exposed, he thought he'd be rejected by God, which is understandable. He covered himself. He put a barrier of protection up. And immediately for Adam, life-perplexing problems came into his head, like they do for us today. I know I'm not who I want to be. Am I going to be rejected by God and others? Can I make it on my own? Will life work out for me? Am I good enough? Will I be accepted? Will I fit in? Will I belong? And because Adam wasn't right, it was just just natural for him to fear rejection. For we all want, actually, above all else, to be accepted, to belong. That's what we want. That's how we've been made, to belong with God and with one another. So we hide behind all sorts of masks and develop all sorts of strategies to avoid disapproval, 
criticism and rejection. So what did Adam do? Well, in the imagery of Genesis, he chose to hide behind trees. It's not the first thing we usually mention, but that was the case. He chose to hide behind trees so that God wouldn't see him. But he also chose fig leaves to cover himself. And ever since, people have been searching for ways to cover their unknown unworthiness, to feel good about themselves and to be accepted, which is what we want. The strategies we use are varied. They can include things like luxury, money, fame, power or pretense, as well as more subtle strategies like shyness, remaining quiet, being loud, boastful, humour, talkativeness, manipulative tears, knowledge, spending time with family and children only and avoiding certain types of people and so on and so on, which enable us in the end just to keep our real self safely hidden from other people. See, sadly, this leads to a self-focused, here-I-am person whose words in the end are powerless when it comes to encouragement because they're absorbed in themselves. See, the truth is we cannot hide from God and meaningful relationships cannot be built on fear. And we all know that deep down. We read in Hebrews 4, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. See, we're all fully known by God. And so hiding from him is an absolute waste of time and a waste of effort. But this is the good news. We need not hide. We need not fear punishment or rejection because God loves us and God accepts us in Christ as we are, as we are. It's love, not fear we need. God is love. We all need God. We read in 1 John, there's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. See, the gospel is not based on the fear of rejection. We don't come to God on the basis of being afraid that we will be rejected. We don't come because we don't want to be rejected. No, 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 we come. It's the love of God that draws us to himself. It's his love. It's the beauty of his being that wins us that draws us to himself, not fear of rejection, but his great love, because God so loves you and me, he sent his son Jesus, and he revealed his love on the cross, and it's in Jesus, it's in him, we find acceptance in God, that frees us to live without fear, without fear of man, or fear of God. I'm talking about a certain type of fear there, a fear of God's judgment. We don't need to fear it in Christ. He's taken it upon himself. We don't need to wear masks. We don't need to. Meaningful relationships are not based on fear, but on trust and acceptance, which is love. We all need to be loved. Every one of us needs to be loved in order to love and encourage. We cannot do it out of our own resources. You see, but the good news is that we are all loved. We are all loved and accepted unconditionally in Christ. And so there's no need to play games by hiding from God, let alone other people. See, when we understand our acceptance in Christ, we're free we're free to take our eyes off ourselves and to be secure in who we are and to be transformed into a there-you-are person. 
It's a beautiful thing when it happens. And so we must find our acceptance in Christ and live a Holy Spirit-led relationship with God and with others. You see, to live in the love of God is the answer. To know how to become real encouragers. That's how we become real encouragers, living in the love of God. Our hiding place, if you like, is in Christ, who is love and who is our eternal encourager. He's the one that comes alongside and gives us power and strength to live and to love. Find our acceptance in him. He first loved us that we might be free to love others. So can you see just how difficult it is to be an effective encourager or be an encouraging church community if our words are more about protecting ourselves? See, when this is the case, our words are not motivated by a genuine concern or interest for others and their well-being. So they lack power. It's just a principle. They just lack power to encourage. And it's difficult for you to receive powerful encouragement if others don't really know you and your needs because of these barriers that are up. The result, of course, is superficial relationships, a shallowness that leads to a superficial community. You know, where people don't really touch one another's lives deeply because there's this sense of distance and, and an inability to connect, to get close to people, which leads in the end to great dissatisfaction in life. No real encouragement can take place where there is superficiality. And Paul's solution, though, and it's important to know this, Paul's solution is not to throw off all inhibitions and to expose all that we are to everyone. No, no, no. Rather, Paul encourages us to commit not to sharing about ourselves, but to understand the fears and the protective mechanisms and defences and needs of others in order to rightly encourage them. It's like he says in Philippians in many places in the New Testament, Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. That's how you encourage. It's freedom from self-centeredness that enables us to encourage others and to be part of the ongoing development of an encouraging community. You see, encouragement is an investment in someone else's future, in someone else's life that pays massive dividends, huge dividends, bigger than we can imagine. So why don't we commit? Why don't we do it this morning? Commit to be a consistent source of encouragement someone who looks to bring the best out of someone else. You know, it's a choice you can make, you know, to lift another person's spirit or to, to change the atmosphere of your home or your workplace. See, when was the last time that you encouraged your wife or you encouraged your husband or you encouraged your son or your daughter? Why don't you decide to be a household of encouragement it's a wonderful thing to be a household of encouragement. Even change the atmosphere of your home where every member is told regularly in different sorts of ways that they are loved, that they are valuable and that their lives have great potential and purpose. A home that only speaks life and nourishment into one another. A home that produces can-do children, realising their potential. 
And outside of our homes, of course, there's enormous space to be encouraged as well. There are many people, and you'll know people, who are in very challenging situations in their life and need encouragement. We all need it. A lonely person, a person struggling to find employment, a grieving person after the death of a loved one, a person battling physical or mental illness. Or do you know someone who has done really well? An acknowledgement of what they have done could well be great encouragement to them to go on and do further good things. You know, maybe a forgotten person who works behind the scenes and uh, is unnoticed. Or a person who has helped you in some way. Or a person who has recently gained a promotion or a new job. Be generous with your encouragement. Let it flow. Genuine encouragement. Be a there-you-are person who invests in the lives of other people. God's heart is for us and for his church to be a community where mutual love and encouragement flows. You know, just as Paul says, encourage one another, build each other up, Encourage each other, love each other. You see, encouragement is not simply in the hands of a few people. No, encouraging, caring, comforting, supporting are beautiful qualities that belong to every member of the body of Christ, every member of the church. And as the writer to the Hebrews says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds and all the more in these days. So let the Lord's strength and love fill you afresh this morning. Let it wash over you as we sing together how great thou art.
is our God. Isn't he? Yes, he is. He's wonderful. And uh, next week uh, we have coming up Father's Day. So hasn't that come around quickly and Dan Rogers will be sharing with us Father's Day, which we look forward to. It should be fantastic. 
And uh, just while we're through this period, this COVID period, there'll be no tea and coffee in the foyer. Uh, but hang around for a little while. Uh, and uh, great opportunity to invite others either to your home or out for a meal or picnic or something, cafe. Uh, beautiful opportunity to connect with other people. So thank you for sharing with us today. And I pray that you go in the spirit of encouragement. God bless you all.